On the topic of the uh, speech from the throne, Mr. Speaker, I'll be splitting my time with the member from Algoma, Manitouan, Campus Casing. Speaker, what we uh, we said that we'd listen with care to the speech from the throne, and we did. Certainly, Canadians expect speeches like this to be full of promises, and this one certainly did not disappoint. But governing isn't about making speeches or even promises. It's rather about what governments do. One of the police forces north of uh, Toronto says it well on the side of their cruisers, Mr. Speaker. It has written the words, deeds speak. And they certainly do speak when it comes to this conservative government. The Atlantic Accord, Kyoto, Kelowna, income trusts, tax increases, lost jobs, export jobs, court challenges, literacy programs, stacking the judiciary, reckless spending, disappointment, broken promises. Indeed, these deeds do speak. Now, the Prime Minister has said MPs in this House have to, as he eloquently put it, fish or cut bait. Vote to support the throne speech, he said, or Canada will get an election. Well, support all the legislative initiatives which will be coming, Mr. Speaker, whether you agree with them or not, or Canada gets an election. Let my minority government function as a majority, even when the people of Canada did not grant him a majority, or Canada gets an election. As a result, some people have called this Prime Minister a bully. Bullies like taking advantage. They look for situations they can dominate. One-sided battles. The Prime Minister's brain trust may be telling him right now that he can afford to bully us. The opposition is weak, the Prime Minister's advisers say. They don't have as much money as the Conservatives do. Their leader is not as experienced. They're not as organized. My goodness, they even have some MPs who are too independent. Well, truth be told, Speaker, there may be something to that. And trust me, we're working on it. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. Canadians didn't send us here to play games of brinkmanship or hurl dares. In fact, too much of what goes on in this chamber is considered by most people watching it to be a national joke. What does matter is that all voices be heard, that all citizens be represented, and not just the conservative demographic. Someone needs to stand up more often in this chamber and speak for the two million income trust investors who lost tens of billions of dollars in savings after this government broke a solemn promise. Someone needs to champion the people from the maritime provinces after this government ripped up the Atlantic Accord. Somebody must lead the way for those Canadians angry and upset that after yet another two years we have done nothing about climate change. Somebody has to give more hope to our First Nations people and the disadvantage that the fight for equality and progress will in fact continue. Somebody needs to give voice to those families who have seen income taxes and mortgage rates increase at the same time, who know record government spending knows they will never ever see a tax increase as long as this government's in place. And somebody needs to get up and fight for all those workers who are losing their jobs as the dollar soars. Export sales are shattered and our finance minister smirks. Millions of Canadians are not impressed with speeches and promises. And neither am I. Millions of citizens want fairness and justice and hope. They want their Canada back. So. Maybe on this side of the house, we're not ready. We may not have enough money. We might not be as organized as those guys. But I'll tell you, Speaker, we have never been more determined. You may be richer over there. You may have more pollsters. You may have a longer campaign plane and more square feet in your headquarters, and you might have a bigger election machine. But as Winston Churchill said, it's not the size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog. The governing party has spent many months and many millions of dollars organizing for an election. They've been tearing down their political opponents daily instead of governing. They have reached new levels 
of negative messaging in this country, and unfortunately, they have confused public service with the naked quest for continued power, since they seek a majority government at all costs. The Prime Minister's fish or cut bait dare is an obvious attempt to goad other parties into entering an election on the Prime Minister's terms. By seeking to nullify the role of opposition members of Parliament, who represent, after all, a majority of Canadians, the Prime Minister is hoping he will get that election he so badly wants. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to quote Jim Travers from the Toronto Star, who said quite eloquently, Harper, Mr. Story, the Prime Minister's fish or cut bait ultimatum is one test of Parliament's growing irrelevance. Those no-name representatives of the people are essentially being told to stand down from their elected task. Under threat of an imminent election, public policy is tightly scripted by an inner circle that only occasionally intersects with ministers or civil service are to be approved without amendment or improvement. Well, let me admit something, Mr. Speaker. I'd love to give the Prime Minister an election. I certainly do not fear the voters in my riding. I think they'd enjoy the chance of having a clear voice right now between our vision of the future, our quest for social and economic justice, and that of a programmed and muted automaton conservative candidate. But fortunately, I'm not the leader. Wisely, wisely, the leader has picked his moment rather than allow the bully to call the shots. He has chosen to fight on issues Canadians are passionate about rather than the thin and tasteless gruel of a throne speech written by the milk toasts in the PMO. Fortunately, the leader of the Liberal Party has clarity and vision and above all the wisdom to understand there is no point having an election when the governing party has already spent millions trying to precipitate it. Uh, that's not to say there will not be a vote soon. We know that. There will be. And the results of it will shock a number of the honourable members opposite who will be lining up for cardboard boxes. But it will not be this week. We will not be pushed. We will not be prodded. We will not be goaded. We will not be intimidated. We will be resolute and we will get the results Canadians want. Like those brave people in my riding who were not cowed by the Prime Minister when I was thrown out of his party, who stood with me. Or those brave people today in the riding of Cumberland, Colchester, Muscadabit Valley, who are standing beside that brave member who stood up for his constituents and suffered the results at the hands of this Prime Minister. So, we will all fight, Mr. Speaker, for those who grieve for the environment will fight for those who cannot abide to see, see our government steal from investors, we will fight for the families whose taxes have risen, for the First Nations who have been ignored, for the manufacturers and exporters and retailers who are shedding jobs and sales because of this government, for homeowners worried about what rising mortgage rates are going to do to the value of their homes in the real estate market, for the people of Atlantic Canada who have been slapped once again by this Prime Minister, for all those who hope this new government would give them hope and promise and change, who have seen more arrogance and narrow focus, exclusion and incompetence than any of us in feared. Well, our leader, our leader was right. No election this week. No giving in to the bully. Instead, soon, you will feel the winds of change, the force of millions of people that this government does not stand up for, does not represent, does not respect. And then, my friends, you'll be blown back and this country will be restored. Thank you, Speaker. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Burlington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member from Halton for his uh, speech. And I find it uh, very hard to swallow, though, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, first of all, the uh, Leader of the Opposition uh, apply, uh, makes him the constituency outreach as part of his new task. Well, when he was a member of the Conservative Party, he told his uh, executive that they weren't allowed to communicate with other uh, riding associations in the area. He talks about negative advertising. He put in my riding 
a, a 10 percenter that was complete lies calling me a liar in the 10 percenter and I happen to be happy to table it here in the house. He's so much uh, off mark on what he's had to say because he says one thing and does something completely other. If he wants an election, he can call a by-election. I can quote him saying that if people cross the floor, there should be a by-election. He's crossed the floor. He should have a by-election if he wants an election. We'd be happy to face him in Halton. My question to him today is this. We have, uh, he commented on a number of things. He likes to claim he likes to answer questions directly. My direct question to him is that we're proposing change to the Senate to make it more democratic. Is he in favor of a more democratic Senate? Yes or no? The Honourable Member for Halton. Thank you, Speaker. Well, uh, I, will, uh, I will certainly answer the Honourable Member's question. Uh, the reason I actually went into his riding to uh, have a town hall meeting is because he's afraid to. And uh, it, was, it was very worthwhile uh, in terms of being able to listen to so many of the Honourable Member's constituents who didn't have the opportunity to actually pose questions to their own member. And, Speaker, they told me when they actually tried to contact the member from Burlington, uh, he had no questions, no answers for them, rather, uh, would not uh, tell income trust investors why the government had actually reversed his position. I was left with no option, Speaker, because I do represent half of the city of Burlington, but to go in and try and make sure the other half of the uh, uh, city was well represented. Uh, unfortunately, uh, members of Parliament who are Conservatives are uh, actually prevented from having effective representation. I had no choice, Speaker. They compelled me. Further questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Windsor West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, please ask a question and try to get this into a debate, hopefully, of some issues of substance uh, as opposed to personalities. And one of the things I'm interested in is the fact of manufacturing. The Member talked about uh, issues related to manufacturing concerns there. I've had those similar concerns expressed to the previous administration when they po promised me an auto policy. They didn't deliver on that. The current government is continuing down that path gives me great concern. Also, what's being debated right now, the only economic lever is going to be a corporate tax uh, reduction, which hasn't historically led to improvement in manufacturing. It hasn't created more jobs. And I know his leader has been racing the Prime Minister in terms of how many more corporate tax cuts can actually happen. And ironically, in ridings like myself, Mr. Speaker, we're witnessing plants go to Mexico, and those companies will get actually a tax cut at a time they're relocating Canadian jobs and throwing people out on the streets. And Mr. Speaker, what I would like to know is in terms of the, the Liberal position right now, is it just for corporate tax cuts? Is that just all they have on the part of the repertoire to deal with manufacturing? Um, or if they have something else, I would like to hear it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Holton. Uh, thank you, Speaker. A good question, a substantive issue, and I appreciate the Honourable Members uh, putting it to the floor. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, we do. And you'll hear about it in due course, my friend. The problem right now, of course, with manufacturing job losses is not a proposal of the Conservative Party to cut corporate taxes in the future. Uh, that has nothing to do with the losses that we're seeing today. The losses today are because of Canada's competitiveness gap, and we are losing jobs to jurisdictions that have a more competitive environment. That's why they're getting the jobs, and there's no question about that. And one of the problems we face today is a dollar of parity. And a dollar of parity has a lot to do with the economic policies of this country, where we've seen government spending rise to a level we've never seen in our nation before. And the Minister of Finance certainly has uh, seen uh, that particular situation develop. And high government spending has always been inflationary, which is something Conservatives pointed out uh, in past uh, times of Liberal governments. Inflationary spending breeds higher interest rates. Higher interest rates attracts capital from around the world. As capital inflows to our country, as long as well as when, because we have petrol uh, currency, petrol reserves, we see our currency rise in value because we are considered to be a, a petrol currency um, country. So the combination of high government spending, a recurrence of inflation, and oil reserves in Canada have driven our dollar higher. That's erased the competitive advantage a lot of our manufacturers have, and our job losses in large part are a result of that. I fear they've only just started, and we have to reverse this trend. And I'd certainly be very pleased to work with the Honourable Member opposite to find ways that we can actually restore our competitiveness instead of eroding it, as the Conservatives have done.